Good morning. What a blessing it is to be here this morning as we've gathered together as God's people to glorify and to praise His holy name, to praise the Almighty El Shaddai, a God who is completely all-sufficient to take care of our every needs, both physical and spiritual. And when we gather here on the first day of the week, we gather uh, remembering that He's taken care of us in the greatest way possible, salvation. Amen. We have that blessing because of his son that we share in communion and we have a world that we want to join in that same family. As we've been looking through the book of 1 Thessalonians, we've been seeing the family of God as Paul saw her as well as how God ultimately saw her. Because Paul fixated his eyes to see God's people the way God sees his people. And a lot of times I can admit myself that I don't always see God's people the way God wants me to. And as I was doing a study in 1 Thessalonians, I remember reading the story about a man named Max who he had learned endurance in such a way that I've never attempted one of these. One of those Ironman triathlons uh, probably will never attempt one of those. Uh, you know, the swimming and the bike riding, I could doggy paddle, but I'm not really a great swimmer. But he did the whole, he did, he did the entire thing. And yet, actually he did a half triathlon, excuse me. And after the 1.2 mile swim and the 56 mile bike ride, he didn't have a whole lot of energy left for the 13.1 mile uh, jog or run. Uh, neither did the fellow, the guy that was jogging next to him. As a matter of fact, as they caught up with one another, uh, Max and this other guy, they caught up with each other and he could hear the other guy grumbling. As a matter of fact, uh, he asked him uh, how he was doing and he soon regretted asking. The man said, man, this stinks. This race is the dumbest decision I've ever made. And Max realized that if he's going to continue on, he couldn't necessarily be around somebody like that, right? Because if not, eventually what would happen to him? He began to think the same thing. So he tried to, you know, nicely kind of move ahead or to at least kind of, you know, get away from the negativity. And he caught up to this 66-year-old grandmother who was running, who was doing this triathlon as well. And as he was talking with her, she had said to him, and I thought this was really amazing. She said to her, her tone was complete opposite of the other man. She said, you'll finish this. It's hot, but at least it's not raining. One step at a time. Don't forget to hydrate. Stay in there. She would keep reminding him of these things. Who do you think he gained the most out of from running side by side with? You know, Paul to the Philippians and all throughout the New Testament, Paul reminds us that we're running a race, right? At the end of his life, he said, I finished the race. He calls this life Christianity a good fight. He told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27 that we strive side by side with one another. That's for the faith, that's for the one faith of the gospel. See, you don't run a race alone. There are other runners with you. Uh, but what type of fellow runner are you? A lot of times we worry about the runners around us, right? But what kind of runner are you? What kind of runner am I? And what I mean by we worry about the other ones, we worry if they're, if they're fulfilling their need, we should help them if they're not. But what kind of runner am I being? I'll be honest with you, a lot of times I like to think of myself uh, in this context as that 66-year-old grandmother, not just on average, but as far as the fact that she was encouraging she ran that race and she encouraged other runners around her. I like to see myself in that light, but a lot of times I'm like that other guy. A lot of times I'm like that other guy. I complain about it. I gripe about it. People ask me, you know, to help them with something spiritually. And I think in my mind, oh man, I gotta go do that. That's not right. It's not right at all. And yet I'm called to be an encourager, right? Christianity isn't just about being encouraged, but also being an encourager. And Paul demonstrated that perfectly. Paul was the kind of person who really embodied what it meant like to be an encouraging brother in Christ. And you and I can have that same thing. And he talks about a congregation that not only he encouraged, but also encouraged him, the church of Thessalonica. I want you, if you will, turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to look at chapter 3. We're going to be reading in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're going to go ahead and pick up in verse 1. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1, we're going to go ahead and break this down. And if you remember in this context so far, the church of Thessalonica was a congregation that received the gospel in much affliction. Uh, first, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6. They received the gospel in much affliction, but despite receiving the gospel in much affliction, they continued to abound, they continued to grow, they continued to thrive. They didn't allow for that affliction to completely destroy the love that they had for people and the love they have for God. And Paul is encouraged by this. Paul even reminds him, he says, you learned this from us because you saw us, that we were like that when we were amongst you. 
And Paul continues in this letter saying how much they loved one another and how he was encouraged by their love for one another. But as well as as we open up this first uh, verse in chapter 3, he says, therefore, knowing, this is what he says, therefore, when we could bear it no longer, what he's talking about there is the fact that even though they didn't suffer alone in the sense that they also had brethren all around the world, the Thessalonians physically in their proximity, they were alone. Uh, they lived in a city in which completely rejected Jesus, especially during the time of this rioting, other than those who were part of the church. Uh, they lived in a city that was a patron city. You've heard me use that phrase all throughout the sermon series, right? Uh, they were a patron city of the Roman Empire, which means what? It meant that they were, if you wanted to see what it was like to worship Caesar and to worship the one true, in their mind, the one true Lord Caesar, you looked at Thessalonica. So when a person becomes a Christian, do they still call Caesar Lord? Oh, who do they call Lord? They call Jesus. So can you imagine the immediate swift persecution they would already receive? That's why Paul said they received it. When they received the gospel, when they learned the gospel, they had it in much affliction. They were rejected by many people in their city. They were rejected by probably family, by friends, by fellow co-workers, by people that at one point they worshipped Caesar and worshipped Dionysus and worshipped Zeus with. But now... They were alienated by those people. And he says this to them. He says, he says, therefore, we could bear it no longer. When we were, excuse me, we were willing to be left behind in Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith. I want to go ahead and stop there. He says, we were willing to be left. You know, Timothy was with us, me and Silas, but we were willing to be alone. Timothy was this huge encourager. And he says, we were willing to part ways with him so he can come to you. We put our needs last in comparison to your needs because you need encouragement. He says, you were in so great need of that, so we sent Timothy. I like how he describes Timothy, Timothy, his son in the faith, but he describes him as a co-worker. He describes him as a brother and God's co-worker. The idea of co-worker. I mean, Paul, could you imagine being around a Christian like Paul? That's infectious. But imagine having two people who were like-minded. Imagine having two people traveling together who would go to these congregations helping each other out and helping them out. He was like-minded in faith. He was like-minded in labor. Paul was a hard worker. And to be called a co-worker meant, man, we're on the same page. He sees souls the same way I do, the way God wants us to. He sees the work of the church the same way it ought to be seen. We've got to ask ourselves, are we co-workers? If Paul looked at us, would he say, you're my fellow co-worker? Or would he say, you're allowing for other people to carry the brunt of the work? Because the way he saw Timothy, he said, you see the work of the Lord is important to you as well. So anyway, we keep on going. He says, our co-worker in the gospel, to establish. This word establish means to strengthen. Uh, Paul uses, or excuse me, Luke uses this word in describing Paul and Barnabas. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 22, when they went to Asia Minor. And they went to Asia Minor, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. He told, he told Timothy, or excuse me, he told the Thessalonians, Timothy came to help you be established as well as to exhort. The word exhort means to encourage through teaching. I can think of Romans chapter 1 and verse 11 and 12 where Paul told the church at Rome, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts to strengthen. That is that we may mutually be encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. We continue in this section what Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll read verse 3. He says that no one may be moved by these afflictions. He says, I sent Timothy to you so that no one may be moved by these afflictions. He's like, I want him to strengthen. I want him to solidify you. I want, you guys are already strong, but I want him to keep helping you be strong. Because I don't want these afflictions to take you away from Christ. I don't want the sufferings that you're going through in this life to lose sight of what's to come. He reminds them in verse 3 that no one be moved by these afflictions for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. He says we were destined, we were appointed for this. You ever saw Christianity from that perspective? You think about how many people become Christians and think that their suffering is going to completely end. They're not going to go through anything else. And yet Paul reminded the church frequently. Jesus reminded his disciples that you're going to go through things. He says, this is what's going to happen in your lifetime. Jesus even says that they hated me. What makes you think they're going to be so receptive to you? He says, I'm, I'm going through suffering. 
And to follow that path of Jesus is to, as well, Paul would even say, welcoming it. He says, I want to drink the cup, a cup of suffering that Jesus drank from. That's mind-blowing, because how many of us pray that? Uh, we do the best we can in our Western culture to keep away from it, right? I remember hearing about brethren in different parts of the world, brethren in China, um, that are suffering immensely. Um, as a matter of fact, there are churches in Wuhan. Uh, I know people who have gone out there and done mission work there. Now, let's be mindful to pray for those brethren out there. I know that whatever's going on in this world, we may think that, well, that's happening over there. It doesn't affect us. Well, it's affecting our brethren. And if we love them, we're going to keep them in prayer. Amen. Amen. But man, over there, you hear the stories of, of brethren over there, the amount of affliction they go through, jail time, the suffering that they go through. And yet I remember one of my, uh, one of my friends even saying uh, how he remembers hearing them pray for suffering. Who prays for that? So we want the world to see that Jesus is real, that even his people during affliction can endure. So they prayed for that. You know, Paul would tell the Philippians in, one, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29, For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in his life. You should not only believe in him, but also. He says, this is what also you get. Also to suffer for his sake. Here's the thing. In the ancient world, they had this view, and it's not really that far off from the way we think, right? Uh, you think, but mostly in the ancient world, they thought if you suffered, what did that mean? That meant that God was mad at you. Remember Job? Job was going through a lot, right? And his friends, Eliphaz, uh, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu, they, were, they kept him saying to him, maybe you did something wrong. Maybe the reason why you're going through all this is because God is just angry at you. That's the way the ancients viewed it. As a matter of fact, even the ancient Greeks, when calamity happened in their life, they thought maybe we've angered the gods. What can we do? Because they thought religion was, a, was, was this mindset that said, nothing bad should happen if you're, if you're following, right? Nothing negative should take place. And yet Jesus reminds his disciples, Paul reminds them here that this is what happens. This is not only a normal part of just life in general, but it's also a normal part of Christianity. Suffering. It happens. And yet in that suffering, in that suffering, because Jesus himself suffered greatly, right? In that suffering, we grow more like him if we allow for it to change us for the better. Because suffering is going to change us regardless, right? Suffering, pain, broken heart, it's going to change us regardless, but how is it going to change us? Is it going to change us and make us better people? We're going to be worse off than before. We have that power to choose. And we've got God's power to help us through that if we're in Christ. But you know, Peter would even say in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 19, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. You know, we continue what, what Paul's saying here. And he says, For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand, there in verse 4, that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, I could bear it no longer. I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter, what are you talking about there? He's talking about Satan, right? He says, The tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Here's the thing. God can use suffering and use trials to make us better. Amen. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? It produces patience. It produces steadfastness. And he says, and let, ha and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Suffering, God can use it for the good and make you stronger. Make you better than what you were before. Maybe some of you can look back, right? Because well, hindsight's 20, 20 isn't it? You can see things clear. Maybe you've looked back and said, man, I went through that, but I came out better. I came out stronger. And there are things in my life, I'm not going to say that I always embrace suffering. No, I don't. There are times that I do my best to avoid it, right? There are times we do that. But I can look back in my life and times that I've gone through hardships and I could say, man, that made me stronger. Hadn't I had gone through that? Where would I be now? Where would I be today? God can use trials and make you better than what you could possibly imagine. Make you stronger than you ever thought possible. Satan, on the other hand, uses temptation. You know what he uses it for? To make you worse. To break you down. Not to build you up, to tear you down. We're told multiple times Jesus was tempted, right? Uh, you think Jesus was tempted by Satan because Satan sought the best interest in Jesus? Absolutely not. He wanted to take away the only hope that humanity had by bringing him down. And if he tempted Jesus, what makes us think that we are immune to that ourselves? Uh, see, Satan has no desire to build you up. He has every desire for your destruction. And Paul says here, he says, I want to make sure that that didn't happen. 
So I want to make sure that through all this, you're still growing because God can use you for greatness, but Satan wants to use you for destruction. As a matter of fact, uh, Peter would even say in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 through 22 that those who knew righteousness and turned back to the world are worse off than those who never knew it in the first place, right? And Paul didn't want that to happen to them. He says it's like a dog returning to their own vomit. Quoting from the Proverbs. Paul didn't want that to happen to the Thessalonians. He wanted them to stay strong, and that's why he sent Timothy to them, because he cared deeply for them. We continue on, and Paul, in verse, as we look at verse 6, he says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you, he's brought us good news of your faith and love. Here's the thing, regardless of their suffering, they still grew. Regardless of their hardships, they didn't see Christianity as a way of avoiding hardships. They were in the thick of it, and yet they still grew. They remained strong. It didn't shake their love. It didn't shake their faith. That's what he says here. He says, they report, Timothy reported to us the good news of your faith and love. Because like Paul says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, the only thing that counts for anything in Christ Jesus is faith working through love. And that's what they grew in. How many of us, when we go through suffering, think that that's going to help us grow more in faith and in love? What happened for the Thessalonians? They saw it as an opportunity. They saw it as an opportunity to bring more people to Jesus. If we can endure what we're going through, we can help you do the same. Because what God has for us, right? Paul doesn't even describe. He says, for the things in this present life are nothing in comparison to what's laid up. He even to the Corinthians says, this light momentary affliction. Paul suffered greatly. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 28. Man, every time I've ever thought I've suffered immensely, Paul suffered so much, and yet he didn't have to. A lot of the suffering that happened to Paul was because he followed Jesus. Paul could have lived a cushy life as a, as, a, as a Pharisee, as a teacher of the law. He studied under one of the best scholars of the day. Paul had everything going for him, but then when he followed Jesus, oh, his life changed. Some people on the surface would look at the life of Paul and say, was it really worth it? But if you ask Paul at the end of his life, he said, oh, yes, it was. He said uh, to the Philippians, I count all these things as rubbish, as garbage, as waste in comparison to what he has laid up for me. Because that's all that mattered to Paul. And that's what he wanted to see his brethren at Thessalonica achieve as well says about the Thessalonians, he says, he's brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, verse 7, brothers, in our, our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. You know, even despite Paul's affliction, think about this. You have these two different groups. Despite the affliction of the Thessalonians, they continue to grow. Despite Paul's affliction, despite Silas, because they had to leave Thessalonica. Back in Acts chapter 17, what happened to them? What happened to them? They were chased out of the city. They were threatened. Their lives were threatened. That wasn't the first and that wasn't going to be the last time that would happen either. And yet, despite their affliction that they went through, despite the hardships, you know who they were thinking about? They were thinking about their brothers and sisters in Christ miles away. Despite what they were going through, all they could think about was the church. You want to know why? Paul would tell the Corinthians, in, uh, excuse me, the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That doesn't mean that Paul had this self-deprecating uh, self view of himself. In other words, oh, I'm, I'm just, there's, there's nothing good about my life and I'm miserable. Paul didn't walk around with his head hung low. He just didn't walk around thinking he was better than people. And he didn't think his needs were more superior than other people's needs. Paul, I mean, that slaps the face of our modern thinking of self-centeredness, right? Of seeking your needs first. Paul was like, no, I'm willing to put myself in harm's way for the sake of others. Because I'm good. I've got Jesus. That's all I need. And I don't want anybody else to forget that. Paul concerned himself with others, even in the midst of his own personal suffering. He would say, as we continue on, in verse 8, he says, For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord. This word for live uh, means not just the removal of anxiety. Because they were worried. They were legitimately worried about the church at Thessalonica. That's why they sent Timothy. They were worried. They prayed fervently. They had anxiety. And yet this word, we live, doesn't just mean that we had the removal of anxiety, but then we were filled with absolute joy. We were restored. We were made stronger because we found out you were standing fast in the Lord. 
For what, verse 9, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? In other words, is there anything sufficient? Is there any thanksgiving sufficient to God for what he's done for you? This is a rhetorical question. In other words, what he's saying, my joy that I've gotten because of this is so immeasurable. How can I ever possibly thank God for it? My thanks would fall short of everything he's done for me. This is how much Paul cared for when brethren stayed firm. Do we look at brethren who have fallen away and we're sorrowful when they come back? Do we say to ourselves, man, that right there, that's amazing. Words can't even describe how strong they've become or how they've come back. Do we love the church that much? Like the way Paul did. We keep reading. And he says, he says, as we look, he says, verse nine, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for all the joy that we feel for your sake before God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. This request underlines the genuineness and, in, excuse me, intensity of his desire to see them. In verse 11, we continue on. Now may we, excuse me, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our ways to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. I want to stop there for a second. This is already in a loving congregation, right? What we've read about the church of Thessalonians, Paul says, man, we heard about your faith, your love, and yet, you know what he tells them? He says, I want you to keep growing in it. I want, you to, I want your love. If you think you're loving right now, keep growing because you can love more. Because God's love is rich, right? And if we think that uh, the way we love, uh, that's, 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 the, that's the standard and that's right there, man, we've, we're wrong. Keep seeking after God's love. It keeps reminding them. It's obvious in this letter that the love they had for one another was so strong, yet Paul encourages them to love even more. He says, abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that you may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord with all his saints. This is the ultimate message of this book right here. Uh, the coming of the Lord and remaining steadfast in those days. Remaining steadfast rather in those days leading up to that. Being strong so that way when that day comes you're ready because that day can come at any time, right? Think about this. Today could be, if you're suffering greatly this week, if you're worried about what may be happening tomorrow, the Lord may return this moment. The Lord may return tonight. And what happens to suffering? It ends. And you just have to endure one more day, or one more hour, or one more season maybe. But even just enduring one more hour, or one more season, or even another five years or ten years, is nothing in comparison to eternal glory with Him. And that's the message of this book that Paul wants them to remember. Uh, but he wants them to continue to abound in love because they're not going to see that if they lack love for one another. I'm not talking about an affection. We're talking about love that produces action. We're talking love that is founded in God. God doesn't just merely say, I love you, right? What does Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 say? That God has demonstrated his own love. What's that word? Demonstrated. He doesn't just say, I love those people, but it's out of my hands. Hopefully somebody else takes care of them. Oh man, I love those people. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to pray for them. No, no, that's not what Jesus did. It says God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he did what? He just stood back and, and watched the world burn? No, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Man, if God's love is demonstrative and we're called to have a love like God, then what does that mean about my love? I've got to demonstrate it as well. Paul would say to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, he says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. In other words, if I, have, if I perform these miracles, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That phrase for noisy gong, clanging cymbal, is a destructive noise. Uh, oftentimes in uh, ancient Greek worship, they would use gongs and they would use cymbals to, you know, to ring in you know, the, their prayers and things like that. He said, but nobody likes a noisy gong. Nobody likes a clanging cymbal. He says, nobody likes those things. He's like, at the end of the day, he's like, those things are annoying. He says, those things are intrusive, especially if they're not done right. He says, and that's what my life is like if I lack love. He says, it's a lot like a cell phone going off in the middle of church. It's a lot like things that distract us from, from everyday life. It's a lot like things that are unnecessary and things that can take our focus off of what ha what's really at hand. He says, that's what my life is like if I don't have love. It's just noise. 
And then he says, if I have prophetic power and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, in other words, I believe God fervently and I live my life with fervent belief, but I have not love, I am nothing. I'm nothing. He says, if I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, in other words, if I'm willing to go to the death, if I'm willing to forsake all earthly, earthly materials and give everything to the poor, which is awesome, right? He says, and even if I was willing to go to the death for the name of Jesus Christ, but I lack love, I have nothing. I gain nothing. Because love is the foundation of Christianity. And I can't be a Christian. Jesus would say it himself, they will know you are my disciples indeed if you have what for one another? If you have love. You know what that means? If you don't have love for one another, guess what you're not? And I'm not talking about, again, Paul's not talking about just some affection just some thought, kind thoughts about one another, but actual love that we care for each other enough that we're willing to put our needs last in comparison to the people around us. Love that says, I'm willing to, I'm willing to go to the ends of the earth to make sure that you are going to be in heaven. Paul demonstrated that love so deeply in Romans chapter 9 when he said, if my soul could be a curse, that every single soul that of my brethren, my Jewish brethren could be saved, I would do it. That's deep, isn't it? Because I don't know if I've ever said that. And yet that's the kind of love Paul had for the church and for the lost. That's the kind of love that Jesus had, willing to take on the burdens of humanity. That's what Paul in Philippians chapter 2 would remind us of. See, Paul and Timothy deeply cared for the Thessalonians, uh, despite their own personal troubles, despite their own personal affliction. You know what else about Paul and Timothy? Paul and Timothy were prayerful for their brethren, for their brothers and sisters, you see, Thanksgiving involves remembering what God has done. Being thankful reminds us that when things go well, it's because of God's goodness and grace and not our own efforts. That's what God reminded the Jews in Deuteronomy chapter 6, that you're here because of me. Everything you have is because of who I am, and therefore, how should they respond in thanksgiving? And likewise, the same thing goes for us. James chapter 1 and verse 17, every good and every perfect gift comes down from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. And when things aren't going well, how does Thanksgiving help us in the midst of that? When things aren't going well, Thanksgiving gives us hope to remember God's faithfulness in the past. And Paul, you know how he uses his Thanksgiving? He expresses gratitude for the church. He expresses gratitude for Jesus and the brethren, the family that he had in Thessalonica. Paul also, he prayed for their strength. Paul prayed for their strength. He didn't just pray that their afflictions be removed. I'm sure he desired for that. He desired that for himself. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, or excuse me, chapter 12, Paul asked God to remove that thorn from the flesh. I'm sure he prayed the same thing for other people as well. But he didn't just pray those things. He knew that their suffering was inevitable. Remember, he said that. Rather, he prayed for something else, that their love would be stronger. When people are going through hardships in the Lord's body, do we just merely pray that it be removed from them? Let's pray for that. But do we also pray, I pray that they're strong to endure it, knowing that when they come out of it, think about all the people they're going to be able to help. Think about all the people they can help that go through the same thing and the lives that they can change and the model of Jesus Christ that they can become if they endure. Do we pray for endurance? Do we pray that their love may continue to grow? You know, Paul expressed this for his brethren even in his own personal suffering, all he was concerned about was the church's growth. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 28 says that. You know what else he prayed for? He prayed for the Thessalonians' future. He didn't just want them strong in the short term. He didn't just hope that they remain strong for today. He said, I want them to remain strong until the Lord returns. Jesus himself would say in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Be faithful unto death and I will give you what? A crown of life. He also prayed for the Thessalonians' future. He didn't just want them strong in the short term. He wanted them ready for whenever the Lord returned. He wanted them ready for whenever God would come back. You know, Paul had genuine concern for their faith. He couldn't stand idly by knowing that Satan was near. Because Satan's not idle, right? Paul cared for them. He cared from the far, but desired to show that care as well. He didn't just say, I love you, I care for you. He demonstrated it in his prayers. He demonstrated even by sending Timothy to them, right? He sent Timothy to build them up and encourage them. And Paul even said, if I could be there, I wish I could 
He says, I hope that the Lord provides a way that I can be with you again because I don't want to just pray for you from afar. Because oftentimes we think that that's, I mean, prayer is important. I never want to, I mean, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, but you know what else makes a righteous man? A righteous man is a person who's willing to be the answer to that prayer. You know what that means? When you pray, I pray that they find encouragement. Are you willing to be the encourager? I pray, Lord, that they be strong. Are you willing to help them bear that burden? Or are we just standing from afar and saying, well, I hope that the Lord works it out. And if we see him at church next Sunday, that's great. If we don't, well, I hope the Lord keeps on helping them. No, what are we doing? How are we act? Paul actively jumped into their lives because he cared for them. He loved them so much. Paul cared for them so much that he would send Timothy to encourage them. And it's because he had genuine concern for their faith. Do we have that for one another? See, are you thankful and prayerful for your brothers and sisters? The Thessalonians loved each other so much that their strength was so evident, even in the midst of their suffering, yet Paul encouraged them to love each other even more. I look at the love of the Thessalonians, and I have to come to the conclusion in my own personal life that I don't always love that way. And yet Paul told them, love more. Paul said, love more. If I'm just settling right now for the type of love that I just have and not seeking that kind of love, I'm missing the whole point of what Christianity is all about. I miss it. And loving your brethren doesn't just mean, loving your brethren doesn't just mean you hope for the best for them. It means that you're going to do whatever it takes to see that that best happens. Because the best thing for them is salvation. The best thing for them is to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And we've got to do the best we can. This isn't just the role of one Christian. This isn't just the role of two Christians. This isn't just the role of a person who's hired to do it by as a preacher. This isn't just the role of elders who are appointed. This isn't just the role of Bible class teachers. Every single one of us in Christ is called to be an encourager, right? Because we're all equipped, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, to do ministry. So if we're all equipped to do ministry, what does that mean? We're all equipped to be encouragers. Encouraged by whom? Encouraging one another because ultimately God is that source of encouragement. And if you have Jesus Christ in your life, what is holding you back from being like Jesus? Who was encouraging, right? Who sought to help his disciples even in his final moments. He's in the garden praying all night. And yet he still goes out to check on his disciples, right? To make sure that they're enduring with him. He didn't just say, well, this is it, all right? See you guys later. No, oh, he, he, he sought there and spiritually on his, in his death on the cross, he sought for their best even then. Imagine if every single Christian here at Westside prayed like this for one another, had love like this for one another, actively sought ways to encourage one another, saw encouragement as more than just prayer. Again, I'm not saying that prayer is not important. I'm not saying that prayer is, is, is inadequate. Prayer is powerful. But God obviously expects prayer coupled with encouraging action. Think about some brethren that you haven't seen in a while and you're hoping somebody talks to them. And maybe you're making excuses and saying, well, it shouldn't be me, it should be somebody else. Well, no, it probably should be you. Because if you're a family member and if you're God's child, why is another one of God's child being left alone? And it shouldn't be just two people. Imagine an entire congregation of people that want to send their love to them. Let me tell you, our ladies' Bible class do an awesome job of encouraging our brethren. They do. They write cards. But let me not just look at that and say, well, the ladies' Bible class already wrote a card that said the West Side Church of Christ is about loves you. No, let me do it as well. Amen? Let's do that together. We've got many different ways that we can encourage one another. So many different ways. But are we actively seeking those things? Man, we've got, we've got a sign-up out there for a Bible reading. You want to talk about being encouraged? Get together and read the Bible with each other. You don't need the congregation to set up an activity for brethren to meet to read the Bible together. And what I mean by that is it, it shouldn't just be two or three people setting that up. It should be all of us saying, let's read more together. We've got a prayer fellowship coming up. Last year we had one of those, and I think we should have them more, but last year we had one of those. We had 20 people there. That's awesome. How many people are in this congregation that could be there? You get what I'm saying? I'm not targeting anybody. I'm not trying to knock anybody because there are times I mess up as well. There are times I miss the mark. But let's encourage one another to do better. Man, 20 people praying uh, last year, that was powerful. Imagine an entire congregation of people who were able to be there doing it together. 
because we're not in this. I'm not in this for me, just me. Let's be in this for each other and help each other get to heaven. If there's anything that we can do for you this morning, we encourage you, man, God's family is awesome. We're not perfect. God's people loves you, and it's because ultimately he's demonstrated greater love, a love that I, I, Paul describes as immeasurable. And if maybe you're feeling alienated in your own personal life, you're struggling with things, there's a God who wants to help you through it and help you endure. If there's anything that we can do for you today, we encourage you to come forward, to put on Christ in baptism, to rise in newness of life as together we stand and as we sing.